we're just going to start this little series out at the beginning, at the prologue. And I have to say that I did anticipate that there would be some crazy throughout this book. Everybody's talking about the dog bull incident, um, frostbitten appendages, ugly talk against Camilla, rude behavior. But in a book this long, I thought that probably we would be getting into the book before we were totally shocked by the behavior. And on page one, I was already like, he needs to check himself in somewhere. He needs to check himself in. First page of the prologue. We're not even in the book. First page of the prologue. He says, when my wife and I fled this place in fear for our sanity and physical safety, I wasn't sure when I'd ever come back. In fear for your sanity and your physical well-being. This isn't Hotel Rwanda. Already, I, I knew. I knew. I was like, oh my gosh. A first page for getting these gems? And so, this series that I am bringing you is entitled, I Will Spare You the Details. Which we are going to go through this book. Chapter by chapter, by painful chapter, may I say. Because the prologue alone was so shockingly and poorly written that I gotta tell you, it's gonna be a slog. And it's only these gems of pure narcissistic confusion that will keep me going, okay? So let's just get into this. Uh, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, because I am telling you, you are going to want to be here for this hot tea. If the prologue alone is any indication of what we have in store for us, y'all better sit back and buckle up because this man is crazy. And I also just want to say this. I do feel sorry for him. I do. There, there is in my heart empathy for this man. I lost my mother, not when I, not when I was as young as he was when he lost his mother, but I did lose my mother. And there have been so many milestones in my life that she has not been here for. And I grieve, and I, I grieve with him for, for the loss of his mother. But what strikes me as really strange in this book is how unwilling he is to make a life after his mother's death. It's, I mean, this is like a textbook case of arrested development. This individual has had no ability to move on emotionally, mentally, since that incident. And it's really sad. So I don't wanna sit here and mock him, but in the prologue, he says, world, you, I want you to know my story. My own family doesn't even know my story. Though I've told them, lo these many years, they just don't know and they just don't care. And I need you, I need you to care. And so here he is, he wants us to care. So let's talk about it. Let's give Prince Harry what he wants. Okay, let's talk about what happened in the prologue. So the prologue starts out, he's in the gardens at Frogmore. He's standing there in the April chill and he's waiting for someone. We don't know yet who he's waiting for, we can only imagine. And he's standing there wondering why they're late, wondering why no one's called him, wondering where the texts are. You know, we had agreed on this time and they're not here and they're failing me again. And so he's looking around at his environment, grieving the fact that again, this could have been his home, but for the fact that he was driven with spear and pitchfork from the country of origin. And he is looking around him and he's having all these little memories of, you know, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And um, he is lonely and scared and overwhelmed. And he's having literally existential crises, looking over in the distance where Wallace Simpson has been buried and wondering, you know, where are they now? Are they in the nowhere? Am I in the nowhere? <laughs> it's just bleak. He, he starts thinking about his grandfather because that's the reason he's here. He's, he's here for... For, for grandpa's funeral. And um, just side note real quick, we, we need to have a little cast of characters 
because nobody is called by any name you would think they would be called. <laughs> I mean, when he talked about Grammy, I mean, I was like, wait a second, what? Grammy? And of course he's talking about the queen, but it just seemed so, um, it seemed so common to call her Grammy. Well, Granny, you know, it's just like, I don't know. Okay. But anyway, so Grammy is obviously the grandmother. Okay. That's not, that's not difficult. Um, he calls William Willie the whole time, which just seems kind of, I mean, I know that's the, the, the family, family name. I guess it is, but it's almost like forcibly diminutive. Anyway, so William is Willie. Um, his mother is Mummy. Mummy. And then um, we have his father. And this is the one that shocked me. He calls his dad Pa. Pa. <laughs> pa. I just didn't know. This is the, the, I think this is the thing that surprised me. When I hear Pa, I'm thinking Laura and Mary. Where's Ma? You know? And so his father's Pa. And they all call him Harold. But his name is really Henry though he goes by Harry. So I don't know. So anyway, perhaps we should have a little, here are the characters, okay? Granny, grandmother. Granny's the queen. Pa, King Charles. Willie, William. Harold, Harry slash Henry. Okay, so got a lot of names going on around here, but this isn't a Russian novel. And I'll be reading some passages to you in a moment that will indicate the quality of this writing is not up to par. So I, I, we shouldn't have too hard time keeping track of who's who. Um, so he's waiting for his, he's waiting for somebody. Um, we can only uh, surmise that it's going to be somebody with whom he's had quite a bit of hardship with already because his anxiety level is revving, revving, revving while he's waiting. And then here they come. <laughs> they're approaching. It's Pa, it's Willie. And they're walking in lockstep. And they're not even showing any sympathy to the fact that he's here wanting to have a conversation. And the reason he's he's in England at all is because the grandfather is dead. Grandfather has died post the horrible interview with Oprah. So, you know, the fact that he even dared to show his face is, I mean, it, it's either incredibly brave or astronomically uh, stupid. And I'm going to go with that one because... And he is here, he's, they're coming, he's getting scared. He's like, I thought they would listen to me. I thought they would come to make peace with me. But instead I can see that they're like really angry and really mad and just, you know, they're, 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 they're coming to beat me into the ground. They won't listen to me again. So anyway, they start walking and, you know, as they're walking, they're making lots of conversation, none of which is what he wants to talk about. And that was something that really struck me too, is that he is there because his grandfather is, has died, okay? This is a funeral event. He's, he's not staying here for like six months. Um, so it's, it would seem like you would just lay your grievances aside and stop trying to have all these little family meetings and get togethers about how you once again have been maligned and mistreated and nobody trusts you. And he wants to have this meeting and he wants them to hear his heart, but he just came off of the Oprah interview in which they called the family racist in which they told a litany of lies that were provable lies. And then he wants to know, why are y'all in lockstep against me? Why, why are you walking down the gravel path as though you're angry with me already? Cause they are angry with you already. Cause you've done everything that would, that would require them to feel upset. If they didn't feel upset, then they would not be alive. So here they come and the, everyone keeps talking about everything other than what he wants to talk about. And, and this is really, really interesting. As he's waiting for them and they're not coming and they're not texting and he feels like they're late and they're snubbing him again, he says that he thought about going and back to the house with his cousins and they were all drinking and telling stories about grandpa. Yeah, that's what you should have done. That's what you should have done. Because what in the world are you doing standing out in the cold waiting for people who don't want to see you? And why are you making this horrible moment of the passing of your grandfather once again about your family drama? Somebody explain this to me. Like, can you imagine the colossal self-interest that you would have to have in order for you to say, hey, grandpa's dead. 
But you guys want to talk again about how you've been so mean to me? Because you saw the Oprah thing and I just don't feel like you heard me. So instead of going and spending time remembering our loved one, I'm just, I'm going to need you to, uh, you know, roll around in the mire with me a little bit more. You know, before I have to catch that plane back to my wife. Who started this whole thing? So can, can you, can you pause your grieving for a second? Because I, I got something bigger. I got something better to talk about. And you guys have to understand me. So they come, they have their walk in the garden. It's, it's go, the talk's going nowhere. The tension's rising. And he says, I've been maligned and I've been mistreated and I don't think you understand. And they're like, no, you're right. We don't, we don't understand why you left. We don't understand who you are. We don't understand what's going on. And he's like, what? You don't understand. You don't understand who I am. All these years, I'm trying to tell you, you don't understand me. And I've explained it so many times and you're not listening. And they're like, we've been listening. You just haven't said anything that means anything. So he literally says in the prologue, he tells them his plight and, and they won't listen and they don't understand. And he says, wow, I thought maybe they really don't. Staggering, but maybe it was true. And if they didn't know why I left, maybe they just didn't know me at all. And maybe they never really did. And to be fair, maybe I didn't either. And the thought made me feel colder and terribly alone but it also fired me up. I thought I have to tell them. How can I tell them? I can't, it would take too long. Besides, they're clearly not in the right frame of mind to listen. Not now anyway, not today. And so, Pa, Willie, world, here you go. Well, thanks, we'll take it. This man has problems. You know what? He wants us to read it. He wants us to know. So let's know, let's know what's going on with Harry. One other thing before I wrap this up. Y'all, this writing is bad. This is some bad writing. As I'm reading this bit about his mom, it's just very evident to me that he just didn't know who she was. And that is what he's grieving. That he lost her before he could know her. And he says the world didn't know her, but when he goes on this long diatribe about her and doesn't say anything, and is comparing her to the swan on the lake in front of him in the starry night sky, it just, it's, it's sad because he doesn't have anything to say. And it's profoundly poorly written. So you don't even, your heart can't even begin to align with what he's saying because you're so distracted by the flowery metaphors he keeps using. Listen to this. Okay, he's talking about his mother. I miss my mother every day. But that day on the verge of that nerve wracking rendezvous at Frogmore, I found myself longing for her and I couldn't just say why. Like so much about her, it was hard to put into words. We'll soon see. Although my mother was a princess named after a goddess, both those terms always felt weak and inadequate. People routinely compared her to icons and saints from Nelson Mandela. Does he know of any other reference? To Mother Teresa, to Joan of Arc. But every such comparison, while lofty and loving, also felt wide of the mark. The most recognizable woman on the planet, one of the most beloved, my mother was simply indescribable. That was the plain truth. And yet, how could someone so far beyond everyday language remain so real, so palpably present, so exquisitely vivid in my mind? How was it possible that I could see her, clear as the swan, swimming towards me on that indigo lake? How could I hear her laughter, loud as the songbirds in the bare trees? Still, there is so much I didn't remember. Obviously because I was so young when she died, but the greater miracle was all that I did. Her devastating smile, her vulnerable eyes, her childlike love of movies and music and clothes and sweets, and us. Oh, how she loved my brother and me. Obsessively, she once confessed in an interview. Well, mommy, vice versa. Maybe she was omnipresent for the very same reason that she was indescribable, because she was light, pure and radiant light. And how can you really describe light? Even Einstein struggled with that one. Recently, astronomers rearranged their biggest telescopes, aimed them at one tiny crevice in the cosmos and managed to catch a glimpse of one breathtaking sphere, which they named Arendelle, the old English word for morning star. Billions of miles off and probably long vanished, Arendelle is closer to the Big Bang, the moment of creation than our own Milky Way. And yet, 
somehow still visible to mortal eyes because it's just so awesomely bright and dazzling. That was my mother. Was it? So what I think is going to be interesting is this is a person who is crippled by a desire to be loved. He, he, he misses the love of his mother. He felt that his father did not love him and he'll take whatever he can get. Even if what he actually has isn't love, it's manipulation. But as long as he feels that people are listening to him, he will lean into that space. So he meets Megan and she's, you know, more than willing to listen to him because she's got plans of her own and he will take that. And this is what happens when you make love an idol because you will substitute any sad little um, counterfeit version of it to appease the pain in your own heart. So we're going on a, on a journey with Harry and I hope you'll, you'll come with us. So like, subscribe, all the things, because this was just a preview of what's to come, okay? Literally the preface. We've got a long road to hoe, y'all, but we can do it together. Stay tuned for chapter one.